These uh, so-called flying saucers have been around for a long time. They're flown by humans. Been around for a long time. It's a very straightforward technology. But if you, going back to that knowledge, ignorance pyramid at the start, if you keep people in ignorance of what's possible, when they see things uh, flying around that they uh, don't believe humans can create, then they think extraterrestrial. And there's a scam being played here in which while these extraterrestrial created and connected bloodlines um, have been running the world and still are all these thousands of years, that we're going to be persuaded that there's some extraterrestrial invasion coming in. And what will that justify? Centralization of global government, global um, army, and all these different things. And that's being played now. We're being prepared for it with more and more of these extraterrestrial stories coming out through things like X-Files, made by Fox Television, owned by Rupert Murdoch, which is owned by this brotherhood. Things like uh, Independence Day, made by 20th Century Fox, owned by Rupert Murdoch, who is owned by this brotherhood. Things like Alien Resurrection, um, made by 20th Century Fox, owned by Rupert Murdoch, who's owned by this brotherhood, and so on and so forth. Now, there's two sides of the brain. Uh, there's the uh, left brain, which is like this world thinks in words. Uh, it's, it's thinks, it thinks it thinks in logic. Um, physical worldview, can I see it, touch it, taste it, smell it? Ah, it exists then. And then there's the right brain, which is inspiration, creativity, the artist, the, the person who does not see limits. Someone who thinks through the heart as well as the brain, the mind. And what the education system wants to do is pour information, most of it provable crap, um, into the left brain and it says, hold it there, darlings, until we give you a shout. And then it says, <coughs> Uh, ladies and gentlemen, you have two hours to complete this paper. Please pick up your pens. <laughs> At which point you're supposed to spew out what it has told you onto the paper. And if you do that well, ah, you get rewarded. Hey, my John is very clever. Hey, you get a good job with all those passes. Oh, your John is well, in well indoctrinated, isn't he? Yes. Now, carrot and stick, if you are thinking for yourself, and you're a young guy or a young girl and you take that stuff in there and you whip it over there and give it a look and you go it's a piece of shit, look at it, look at it if you tell your exam paper that there's a phone call, hello is that Mrs Jones? <clears throat> Billy is a disruptive influence in the classroom. You mean he's asking questions? Yes, they'll all want to do it. Yeah? The Freemasons did not begin in the, what, 16, 1700s like they claim. That was just when they, they moved and called themselves another name. This thing goes back to the far ancient world. And just to give you an idea of that, I just want to pick um, um, three secret societies up that were formed around the time of the Crusades. In the 1100s they were formed and through into the 1200s. And they were formed in that area of the world, Jerusalem, that kind of area, during the Crusades in that period, like I say. One of them was called the Teutonic Knights that relate to Germany. And that Teutonic Knight network continues today and it was that network in Germany in the 20th century that created the Nazi party and brought it to power. Another one, formed around the same time in the same area of the world, was called the Knights Hospitaller of St. John of Jerusalem, which in its Catholic version today is known as the Knights of Malta, the official head is the Pope, and in its Protestant version is known as the Knights of St. John of Jerusalem, um, and the official head is the Monarch of England. The one I just want to follow just for a few minutes, to give you just an idea for, of how a secret societies in the ancient world have come through to the present day, um, is to talk about one that was formed again at the same time as the other two, basically, called the Knights Templar. This was an organization um, came out of France and came to um, Jerusalem, and there were only about nine of them. And they parked themselves next to Temple Mount, and their official story is that they were formed to protect pilgrims visiting the Holy Land. Well, you're going to protect a lot of pilgrims with nine people. It's a cover story. Um, they stayed there for some nine years or so 
And according to excavations in that area in the uh, 19th century, um, artifacts and, and uh, things were found, signs were found that the Templars had been under Temple Mount. Whatever, something changed very quickly after around nine years because a couple of these guys came back to France and started signing up the aristocratic families of Europe. They clearly knew something big time. They became extremely wealthy because you had to give your wealth and land to the Templars to join. And they set up what is effectively the banking system of Europe um, out of places like uh, Paris and London that were their major headquarters. In 1307, they had the uh, crown heads of Europe up to their necks in debt to them um, with a scam that follows these bloodlines everywhere that they have come, right to the present day. And the scam is lending people money that doesn't exist and charging them interest on it. That's the scam. And uh, Francis Bacon wrote a book called The New Atlantis. Fra Francis Bacon was an initiate of this uh, network, uh, wrote a book called The New Atlantis, which was um, looking forward to the new America. So then you had this uh, colony in America, and then you had the time when the colonies apparently um, rebelled and wanted um, independence. Um, a lot of the founding fathers, I'm not saying all of them, but a lot of the founding fathers, like Benjamin Franklin here, were Illuminati placemen. Their role was to move America from an in-your-face colonial dictatorship to a covert, controlled from Europe still, um, underground, hidden-hand dictatorship. While this guy was opposing royal rule from Britain, um, he was a bosom pal of the um, royal family of Britain. He was in a, a notorious secret society called the Hellfire Club, in which the royal family had members and was um, uh, run by a guy called Sir Francis Dashwood on his estate at Wickham that was involved in uh, horrendous bloody rituals um, and what have you, which again follow these bloodlines all the way through history. He was just there to ease the nature of the dictatorship from one to another. And interestingly, a few years ago, they had a 1.5 million pound grant to renovate his former house um, in Craven Street near Trafalgar Square into a museum to his life. And when they dug the floor up, what this is about, they found 10 bodies, six of them children, um, under his floor. And this story is talking about how the bodies have been um, connected to the time that he was there. And it says that he must have been into body snatching for medical research. <laughs> When you realize what the Hellfire Club were up to, I think there could be an alternative explanation. These guys are into some very dark, dark stuff. And when you realize, I'll say this, what they're into, it is no longer a problem understanding how these guys can send the troops in to slaughter thousands of people and have no emotional empathy with the suffering whatsoever, so much so, okay, that's done, now who next? There, is, uh, there are an enormous number, millions in America, of mind-controlled people. The government mind control project, MKUltra, actually some of it came to light back in the 70s to such an extent that the government had to settle out of court with some people to stop the thing going to court and um, the whole thing starting to come out. But what came out was once again a fraction of what actually happened and there are offshoots of MK Ultra that are specific for certain tasks like assassinations and what have you um, that are perpetrated by the very people I'm talking about here to advance their agenda and it works like this we have a mechanism in the mind which shuts out the memory of extreme trauma this is what kicks in when we have a really bad road smash and we can't remember the immediate run up to the uh, impact, the impact on what happened afterwards. And on that level it's a good thing because what the mind does is it puts an amnesic barrier around the memory of extreme trauma. Therefore, good thing, we don't keep reliving the horror in our conscious mind. What they realized, and one of the key people involved in this in the modern world, because they've known about this for a long time, 
was Joseph Mengele, the angel of death in the concentration camps of Germany, who had an endless number of people on which to um, experiment, particularly children. And they perfected a uh, form of mind control called trauma-based mind control, in which, to be most effective, you start with children before the age of five and six, and what you do is you traumatize them in every way you can think of. You first of all establish what makes them most terrified and then you make them experience it. You make them experience having animals sacrificed in front of them, children sacrificed in front of them. You have them abused sexually and violently and what happens is because the mind shuts out uh, extreme trauma, amnesic barriers form like a honeycomb all around the mind. In the mind control industry, they call them altars. They give people a front altar, which is the personality that people around them think is them, the one that interacts with people in the daily world. What they do, however, and what they found, is that you can program these altars, these um, amnesic barriers, each of which are under the impression they are the whole mind, with certain programs and with certain tasks. And you push these um, programmed altars into the subconscious and the front altar, which they give you, oh yes, that, that's old Billy or that's old Mary, yes sir, I know her. But in the back are these programs and all they need is whatever has been programmed in as the trigger word, the trigger phrase, the trigger color, the trigger sound. And when that trigger happens, the front altar swaps with the back altar and that becomes in control of events. <clears throat> We've all heard about the Manchurian candidates and all that stuff. We're talking that massively advanced. And what they do with these people, and I've talked to so many of them,